Deanne Pierce, you're not allowed to go to Colorado anymore. <laughs> Good morning. Our opening words this morning are from the Reverend Kathleen McTeague. And Windsor will be our chalice lighter this morning. You who are broken hearted, who woke up today with the winds of despair whistling through your mind, come in. You who are brave but wounded, limping through life and hurting with every step, come in. You who are fearful, who live with shadows hovering over your shoulders, come in. This place is sanctuary and it is for you. You who are filled with happiness, whose abundance overflows, come in. You who walk through your world with lightness and grace, who awoke this morning with strength and hope, you who have everything to give, come in. This place is your calling, a riverbank to channel the sweet waters of your life, the place where you are called by the world's need. Here we offer in love. Here we receive in gratitude. Here we make a circle from the great gifts of breath, attention, and purpose. Come in. Spirit of life, God of many holy names, source of all being. We acknowledge one entry in our journal today where an anonymous person has written the loss, the death of a friend. May we hold this person in our hearts. Our meditation reading today is from Warson Shire, a 29-year-old female British writer who was born to Somali parents in Kenya. This poem called Home has been edited slightly due to some violent content. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbors running faster than you, breath bloody in their throats, the boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factory is holding a gun bigger than his body. You'll only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one leaves home unless home chases you, fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. It's not something you ever thought of doing until the blade burnt threats into your neck. And even then you carried the anthem under your breath only tearing up your passport in an airport toilet, sobbing as each mouthful of paper made it clear that you wouldn't be going back. You have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. No one burns their palms under trains beneath carriages. No one spends days and nights in the stomach of a truck feeding on newspaper unless the miles traveled mean something more than journey. No one crawls under fences. No one wants to be beaten, pitied. No one chooses refugee camps or prison, but prison is safer than a city of fire. No one could take it. No one could stomach it. No one skin would be tough enough. The go-home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers seek, sucking our country dry with their hands out. They smell strange, savage, messed up their country, and now they want to mess ours up. How do those words, the dirty looks, roll off your backs? I want to go home, but home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of the gun, and no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore, unless home told you to quicken your legs, leave your clothes behind, crawl through the desert, wade through the oceans, drown, save, be hunger, beg, forget pride, your survival is more important. No one leaves home until a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave. 
Run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. Our reading today is from the Reverend Meg Barnhouse, who is the senior minister at First Unitarian Universalist Church in Austin. And the title of the reading is called, How My Congregation in Austin, Austin, Texas Decided to Give Sanctuary to an LGBT Activist Facing Deportation. Solma Franco, an LGBT activist from Guatemala, needed sanctuary. She and her partner had a food truck here in Austin, and she'd been here four years, meeting regularly with immigration officials as her plea for asylum was processed. She'd had good hope of a visa, but her lawyer messed up the paperwork, and she'd ended up in detention for seven months. Her partner had managed somehow to raise the $15,000 for her bond. With the bond at risk, still with a good chance of being granted a visa, it seemed there was no way her paperwork would be completed within the time she had left. Her deportation date was in 10 days. The call for sanctuary for Soma Franco came to First UU Church of Austin because we have the reputation of being welcoming to LGBT folks and because we had been doing anti-racism work within the congregation and beyond. Word had gotten out to the immigrant community. A regular board meeting was scheduled for that night. I told the board I felt rushed by this request, pushed, that I didn't like doing things without knowing what I was doing and that I didn't have enough information. None of us liked that. It was scary. What would the ramifications be? Could she not just stay in someone's home? No. Sanctuary was an ancient tradition dating back centuries where soldiers would not come into a holy place and drag someone out. A church was the only place that would do. Why was Sulma in trouble? She had been organizing LGBT groups at a university in Guatemala and had been attacked and threatened. She had ridden north on top of a train, tying her belt to the roof rail so she wouldn't fall off. It wouldn't be safe for her to return to Guatemala. But if she missed her deportation date, she and her partner would lose their $15,000. And if she went back to Guatemala, there was no way she would be allowed to pick up her case for asylum where it had left off. Back at the board meeting, suddenly a man at the end of the table said, I think we should do it. A thoughtful and lively conversation ensued. Each of us struggled more within than with one another. A man at the other end of the table said, this fits perfectly with our mission that we say together every Sunday. If we don't do this, what do we do? Silence. I told the board that they had preached to me that my mind had been changed. We should do it. In the 10 days that followed, a man came to install a shower. We sent out an email call for furniture, and we had all we needed within a couple of hours. The minister of a nearby Presbyterian church called to say his congregation wanted to partner with us. The Sunday after Sulma moved in, I talked to the congregation about offering help to this single refugee. I told them about the board meeting. I told them about the Presbyterians who were willing to stand with us and that their minister was preaching about us that very morning, telling his folks that the UUs had seized the prophetic moment. When I introduced Sulma to the congregation after the sermon, the people rose as one, applauding and welcome. She spoke to us in Spanish about her gratitude, about wanting to be a contributing member of the community. Months passed until Sulma heard from immigration officials who request, requested a meeting with her in San Antonio, promising she would not be arrested. About 50 of us accompanied Sulma to San Antonio, where we locked arms with her and stood in the hot sun singing. The TV cameras were out in force. After a meeting and paperwork, Sulma was granted a stay of removal. She would not be deported. 
People all the way to Washington know about this case, the immigration agent said. A whoop of triumph arose as we came out, Sulma holding her paperwork high. We celebrated with Tex-Mex food and mariachi music. Come as you are, as a friend, as I want you to be. Do you see a contradiction in those words? Come as you are, but perhaps it would be more comfortable for me if you came as someone like me, maybe from the same race, class, culture, religion, gender, identity, sexual orientation, life experience, age, and educational level as me. But feel free to come as you are. Mm -hmm. Does that sound like sanctuary to you? Not really. Sanctuary is pretty much the opposite of that. The word sanctuary has a few different meanings, but they're all really interrelated. Sanctuary is refuge or safety from pursuit, persecution, or other danger. And another definition is that sanctuary is a holy place, a holy place that serves as a refuge from pursuit, persecution, or other danger. The early origins of the word were in reference to a church or other sacred place where a fugitive was immune by the law of the medieval church from arrest. Sanctuary has a lot of history and a lot of different levels. Earlier, we sang, make us aware we are a sanctuary, each made holy, loved right through. So we ourselves can be living, walking, breathing sanctuaries when we engage with the world. Last fall, we passed out safety pins to wear as symbols of being safe people, for people of many different identities that might be at risk of being treated as less than human, less than equal, less than holy. That is sanctuary. And you know, sometimes we really need to practice being sanctuaries to ourselves. You know, sometimes we have to let go of that inner persecutor that says that we're not good enough or smart enough or competent enough or worthy of love, worthy of respect, worthy of joy. So within our own selves, we have to find a safe place, a sanctuary, free from self-persecution and self-harm. It brings to mind that old saying, my body is a temple. But I'd actually say that the whole self is a temple. It's an imperfect temple, at least for most people, I would say, but the self is holy and something that should not be desecrated. So as a collection of individuals, individuals walking, breathing, serving as sanctuaries, as a congregation, we can be a sanctuary too. Now, I know some of you might be getting a little nervous, especially those of you on the board, that I'm talking about housing people at risk of deportation in our church building, right? <laughs> They've done this at First UU Austin, but that's a big church with big, really big facilities. And I have to say, I would be totally all over this idea, except our building, realistically, it's just way too small. But the churches that do house individuals who are at risk of deportation are actually relying on a policy in addition to the one of the ancient soldiers. And the policy um, from ICE was written in 2011. And it's a policy directive that tells agents to avoid sensitive areas such as churches, hospitals, and schools when conduct conducting deportation actions. Federal immigration officials say that this policy is still in effect but recent arrests around the country, including inside courthouses, are increasing fears that this too will change. But I'd like us for a moment to back up and look at the big picture, how it's our mission to be a sanctuary every single day, not only to those who are at risk of getting deported, sanctuary to everyone, everyone. I would say we should offer sanctuary to Puerto Rican citizens who happen to be U.S. citizens. 
Everyone who comes through our doors on Sunday morning, especially those who are new, those who may be different in some way, those who actually are coming to find sanctuary, a safe place, a holy place, a refuge from the difficult world we live in, a brief respite from life's challenges and problems, and kind, encouraging words from a stranger. That's everyday sanctuary. That's what our values tell us we should be doing. And if we're not doing it, we're really not who we say we are. You know, this really is not a club in which the prospective member must prove they fit in or prove their worthiness or win the acceptance of the powers that be. We have no rank, we wear no stripes, and we require no letters of recommendation. Praise be to the universe. <laughs> this place, it's a spiritual workshop. It's a laboratory in which we practice a thing called beloved community. We learn what it feels like to be one of a single human family with no others and no outsiders. And when we get really, really good at it here, we can practice this in the world. So the people in line at the supermarket are not others. They are me. They are we. We are all loved. We're all loved like family. And you know, and they say that Unitarian Universalism isn't challenging that it really doesn't expect a lot of people. We don't have sin, we don't have damnation, but you know what, we're supposed to love everybody all the time, like siblings in one common humanity. Isn't damnation looking a little better right now? <laughs> yeah, because can you think of a greater challenge than universal love? I mean, really, it's not easy. I struggle with it all the time. But that's what it's all about. It's about answering the call of love. I mean, I know we have our science and we have our intellectual stimulation and thought-provoking sermons and programs, but so do universities and lecture series. It's the love that makes us a religion. It's what we do in the world with our love that makes us relevant. It's answering the call of love, love over creed, beyond difference, radical love that unbinds us from the conditioning, those lies we're told that there's an us and there's a them. That's a lie. So doesn't that seem like a spiritual path if you've ever heard one? Universal love. So we strive to be sanctuaries for our own selves and aspire to be a sanctuary for all people of goodwill. I'm not really gonna offer sanctuary to someone, someone from a hate group, but all people of goodwill. So if you follow through on that logic and that ethic, it is understandable why congregations are serving as sanctuaries for immigrants and refugees, even if they can't provide physical housing. The sanctuary movement in Austin has grown from a handful of churches and advocates to more than two dozen congregations and religious groups, three labor unions, several nonprofit groups, and dozens of individual volunteers. Nationally, the sanctuary movement has grown to more than 800 churches and congregations, all of whom are called by their faith, whether it's Judaism, Christianity, or Unitarian Universalism, to participate. The growth in the Austin network of which First UU of Austin is a part has meant more resources for outreach and opportunities that involved meeting, involve meeting people where they are versus harboring them in churches. Some churches are forming rapid response teams where the goal is to arrive at the scene when immigration officials are trying to detain someone. These teams can show up and pray or even after someone is, is detained, members of the church can document what happened and serve as witnesses, collecting reports from family and neighbors. Also, rapid response can mean showing up in large numbers at a detention center, advocating for someone to be released. But there are also less confrontational ways to be a sanctuary congregation. Some congregations hold seminars on preparing deportation defense packets, including working to get power of attorney for children so they don't go into foster care if their parents are deported. Volunteers also go with immigrants fearing deportation to court visits or immigration appointments. 
Sanctuary churches are visiting immigrants being held in detention centers, helping to find legal counsel for the detained, holding fundraisers to pay lawyers to help those about to be deported in getting their affairs in order. <coughs> Branching away from Austin, First UU Church in San Antonio has recently decided to become a sanctuary church, although they are not providing physical housing to those who are threatened, but with detention or deportation. Their sanctuary congregation team is lucky to have two employees of Raesis, a Texas nonprofit with offices in Austin, San Antonio, and Corpus Christi that provides legal and other types of services to the immigrant community. And just last week, I was asked by a Unitarian Universalist Raesis employee in San Antonio if our church would be interested in becoming a sanctuary congregation the first one, as far as anyone knows, in Corpus Christi. They offered us coaching and help to replicate what they are presently doing in San Antonio. And of course I said, yes, I would personally love to do this, but we need some congregational volunteers behind this project. We've got a relationship with the Corpus Christi Immigration Coalition. We have these people in San Antonio who know what they're doing and are willing to help us. We simply need a few committed people. They say four to six people would be a good start. So if you're excited about this and want to get involved, just let me know. My hope for everyone here today, before you go home, most likely to a place that is not like the mouth of a shark, is to think about your role as sanctuary. Are you a safe haven? a refuge for yourself, for all people? What do we need to do as a congregation to become more of a sanctuary, not only for immigrants, but for all people, including anyone who may see, be seen as an outsider or different? To be a place where you really can come as you are, even if that means defeated or destitute, how must we evolve to be that wide open and inclusive? Looking to the day when we finally become aware we are a sanctuary, each made holy, loved right through. So that every day we are, with thanksgiving, a living sanctuary anew. May it be so. All right, we're going to try an, an, an old hymn today in a new version. Um, we're going to sing what we've known as Standing on the Side of Love. But there's a story. We've changed the words a little bit. Um, in our UU movement, there's been um, some concern that the word standing on the side of love is ableist because there are some of us who cannot stand. Now, I have to tell you, when I thought of this, that sounds kind of ridiculous. Standing on the side of is a metaphor. How can a metaphor hurt anyone? How can it make them feel bad? Then I talked to someone who cannot stand, and my mind was changed. The mind was changed of also, also changed of the songwriter, Jason, Jason Shelton. He can't recall all of our teal hymnals, but he's recommended that the words standing on the side of love be made more inclusive. And so now we're going to sing answering the call of love. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> Please rise in body or spirit. Oh, 
seated for the closing words that are from Erica Hewitt. I'm also going to ask you to do something we don't normally do at the end of service, but I'd like to try it today. I'm going to ask you to please join hands to the degree you can, because we're spaced out. You may stand if it's easier to reach people. We'll figure this out. <laughs> like I said, it's new. Aww. The hand in yours belongs to a person whose heart is sometimes tender, whose skin is sometimes thin, whose eyes sometimes fill with tears, and whose laughter is a beautiful sound. The hand you hold belongs to a person who is seeking wholeness and trusts that you're doing the same. As you leave this sanctuary, may your hearts remain open May your voices stay strong. May your hands remain outstretched. You may be seated. <laughs> 